What's up, peers, and welcome to Join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. And today I'm joined by the one and only Alex Gladstein from the Human Rights Foundation. And we're going to have a great conversation about, well, all things Bitcoin and how it relates to freedom uh, in different areas around the world and how monetary controls and fascism is all over the place and how Bitcoin is a tool to solve that. Uh, and uh, as well to go against the surveillance capital, uh, the surveillance state, uh, which is currently manifesting uh, at uh, ever staggering rates and tools that we can use today uh, to uh, protect ourselves and our privacy in these regards. Uh, and among many other things, uh, Alex is a prolific writer uh, and great philosopher. Uh, so I'm sure that the knowledge that he will share today uh, will be quite staggering. Uh, and as always, with this and with many other Bitcoin podcasts, upgrade to Podcasting 2.0. Go get yourself a new podcastingapp.com uh, and boost some sats to those content creators that you value most. Uh, pretty much all Bitcoin podcasts are onboarded now. Uh, so come join us over here. The grass is much greener. <laughs> and with that, and without any further ado, Alex, how are you? Uh, I'm great. I'm, I'm, I'm busy. You're busy. Uh, the... Price of freedom is eternal vigilance. So here we are. Yeah, very much, right? And uh, we all have to do uh, quite a substantial amount of work uh, just to stand still uh, in the realms of freedom protection. Uh, but you have been doing, for sure, a monumental amount of work. Uh, but before we get into uh, those nuances, like what what drives you? What, what was the motivation force that got you into all of this venture? Well, originally, I had spent a decade working with people who live under dictatorial regimes uh, and, and tyranny, uh, sort of, let's say, the more aggressive form. The, there are all kinds of tyranny in the world, but the most pernicious would be, you know, straightforward political tyranny where there are no opposition political parties, where there's no independent media allowed, where there's no independent judiciary, where there's no private property respected. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, about 4.3 billion people live under some kind of authoritarian state. Um, there are, of course, excessive violations of individual liberties under all governments, but many governments have mechanisms whereby the citizens can swap the leaders, can push back, can sue the government, can expose them. So there's different structures around the world. So we, we focus on the countries that kind of have the, um, you know, we, weakest uh, protections. Um, and it's a lot of work. I mean, it's 4.3 billion people, 95 countries, it's, it's plenty. Um, and that was my background. So I, I looked quite a bit over the years at technology and, and the role that technology would play. Starting in 2007, I helped send uh, movies dubbed into Spanish and, and books into Cuba for the underground library movement there. You know, they were stuck, they continue to be stuck in this kind of uh, communist police state, but they are able to use technology to get outside, in, at least in their minds. Um, and that led, led, led us later to work on North Korea as well, where we've been like sending uh, USB sticks filled with outside information into North Korea over the last uh, decade. We've sent about 100,000 USB sticks and SD cards in. So our politicians out here are dithering and useless and basically supporting the North Korean government in different ways for different reasons. You know, the Chinese, the Americans, the, the South Koreans, like no one really wants to see the regime fall. So, so they kind of just... Um, keep the status quo, which means that these gulags and horrible conditions for these people just persist. So we could do something, you know, we, we can act, we can, we can help individuals. So we've been peacefully sending in information and technology, and we think that that's very important. We also do a lot of digital security training for activists to help them understand how to use things like Signal or VPNs. Um, we, we've been doing that since 2013. And I would say that the activist movement, generally speaking, that we interact with has 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 figured it out. Like, like in 2009, when we started doing big, large scale events, connecting people, almost no activists from abroad were using any kind of privacy protecting technology. I would say less than 5%, uh, you know, may, maybe much higher in terms of American activists or European activists, but like broadly, globally, no. By 2019, 10 years later, 
it was massive. I mean, now all of a sudden, you know, I would say more than 90% of them were using some sort of privacy technology. They understood it. So, so we achieved a great deal in terms of communications privacy in that decade. Uh, but the next front, the next war is certainly on financial privacy, financial freedom. And, you know, I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, uh, you know, initially it came on my radar in 2013 and we started accepting it as, as at HRF actually at the Human Rights Foundation in 2014. But I, I was a little skeptical for many years. Uh, unfortunately, I, I paid I paid the iron price <laughs> uh, in more ways than one. But eventually I started to understand it in early 2017. And for the last five years, I've been just kind of going down the rabbit hole further and further and further. And I think that's a good place to start the conversation because if you, I think if you don't understand what Bitcoin is and the features of it and what it aims to do, what it makes possible, then you might be tempted to try and create financial privacy with other mechanisms or systems. And to me, that's, that's not like an efficient use of time or energy because this is the open source free money project for the world. Um, and, and this is what we should be spending our time on. So I obviously appreciate what you guys are doing. I mean, anybody can create a privacy altcoin, but I, I don't think that's gonna help in the end. So I, I appreciate the Bitcoin focus and maybe we can start with that. Yeah, I, I agree. This this focus on Bitcoin is is quite important, and uh, we've reasoned with Napara about this. That uh, basically Bitcoin is, for many reasons, almost inevitable in its uh, achievement of a monetary, um, well, success. Let's say, um, but its privacy aspects are not yet really inevitable. Uh, like the the potential Correct. privacy leaks that we currently still have in everyday use are quite bad. So if we scale at, at this rate of privacy, we will have a serious problem. And since we cannot stop Bitcoin from succeeding <laughs> on monetary terms, well, uh, this means we have to very quickly fix all the privacy and fuck ups uh, of the last <laughs> couple of years. Yeah. So two things on that. Um, I do agree with you. I think it's inevitable. I mean, I think Bitcoin does not need our help. Bitcoin will complete its mission eventually of replacing central banking. I, I think that that's what it's going to do. And I don't think it needs our help. Um, however, as you say, you know, humans can, can steer it in a particular direction. I think that it achieves its goal over time through, uh, through its NGU, through number go up technology, through the fact that it has an independent and predictable monetary policy, uh, which cannot be uh, debased, which cannot be manipulated in a back room with cigars and, and at Davos. Like there, there's no shady group of people who can just like change the monetary policy of Bitcoin. That exists for every other cryptocurrency it, 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 from Ethereum all the way on down and for all fiat currencies. So for all other uh, forms of digital currency um, and for all other fiat monies, uh, digital or otherwise, there exists a small group of people who can change the rules. Um, not the case in Bitcoin. And, and I think that's why we all, you know, are, are, are so committed to it is because it's our one shot, right? Uh, it's our one shot to escape this like fiat system where people can just do things by decree, right? Um, in Bitcoin, you know, we, we control the rules, the users control the rules. And, you know, we have a history in Bitcoin of proving that. And, and that's why I'm here. With regard to privacy, I think it's worth uh, drawing distinction between the legacy systems, privacy and Bitcoin's privacy. I think this is very important. I, I think this is what often people don't understand or miss. Like, and it's, it's a little bit of like the practical and here and now versus what is ideal. So clearly from like a theoretical perspective, Bitcoin has like bad privacy or, or, or has many vulnerabilities, but from a practical perspective, it's way better than using your credit card or the legacy system. Like it just depends on who you are, where you are, but like, obviously, if you live in Nigeria um, and you are fighting against the government, uh, that government is not doing chain analysis right now. Like, you know, now it may in the future, but right now they're not. So whereas they could use their surveillance power to understand that you were accepting donations last year for the protests against the police brutality, and they were able to use that information to shut down your bank accounts and fintech accounts. That's QED. Okay. They could not figure out what you're doing with Bitcoin and they could not figure out their bank accounts. So uh, the feminist coalition set up a BTC pay server. The government had no clue what was going on. I don't even think they know what BTC pay server is, but let's say even they do, if they did, 
they weren't in a position to be be sophisticated enough to de-anonymize what was happening. And that's what we call kind of practical here in the now privacy. So I think it's really important to distinguish these two things. There is ideal and theory, and then there is practice. And, you know, look, over time, I do agree that governments will get better and better and better at, at, at sort of exploiting any vulnerabilities here. But just the very fact that Bitcoin is this parallel system that does not uniquely, rather that does not natively uh, have your ID stack in it is a huge advantage for human rights activists. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not vulnerable but in the same way that it doesn't, like Signal has your phone number on it. Okay, that's not ideal. Guess what? I still tell people to use Signal. I mean, there's vulnerabilities with VPNs. Well, guess what? You're still better off using a Tor or a VPN than not. So it's 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 all just like uh, an understanding that you can't press a button to achieve privacy. It's like a way of life, okay? And then there's ways to make yourself not the lowest hanging fruit, right? Um, and in a lot of ways right now in the global human rights movement, it's it's honestly more about freedom than privacy at the moment. Like Like the larger issue is just the fact that like, many people have their bank accounts shut down or they are cut off or they or their money is debased and bitcoin is their way out and for many people the government is not in a position technologically or financially to do mass surveillance you know to try and go after them uh using the sophisticated technology that the nsa and that five eyes and that the european governments have i think that's really important to distinguish i don't know what are your thoughts on that Oh, absolutely. Uh, just as a reality check, privacy in the fiat banking system is absolutely non-existent <laughs> in, in very many ways. Of course, full KYC data, full transaction history, uh, who paid whom, when, which party right. settled the transaction. Well, except for, no, except, for, except for cash, of course. But guess what? Cash is being eliminated in different ways. And, you know, this I wrote this whole piece for Cato about uh, what would financial freedom and privacy look like in the post-cash world. Well, guess what? What? Who are the two biggest contenders for the heir to the social functions of cash, which are small payments, private payments, and savings? Guess what? It's CBDCs and Bitcoin. And I know which one I'm going to go with. <laughs> so so there we are, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So so Bit Bitcoin, even if even with all its flaws in, in regards to privacy and even when the user would shoot himself in the foot 10 times along down the journey with a high degree, your privacy is going to still be better than if you were using your banking system. Um, uh, at least in some regards, right? I mean, you can make quite bad mistakes in Bitcoin, but the, the gist of it is, right? If you use it somewhat reasonably, you're a lot better than in any banking system. And if you learn a little bit of extra and learn how to use the powerful tools correctly, well, then your privacy can be right. substantially and, and, better. And that's where I, I would, well, first of all, censorship is essentially impossible regardless. Yes, they can go find you and arrest you later, but like the mere fact that like, Right now, geopolitically, technically, if I send it, I don't care who I am. I don't care what government blacklist I'm on. If I send a UTXO somewhere, it's going. It's not. It's it's going to get processed by a miner, and it's going to be put into the blockchain. Like that's happening. So that is it, that's a really important distinction from the fiat system. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get arrested later, but it does mean that we have the freedom to send, and that's like a, an unrestricted freedom at the moment which is really, really different from the fiat system. And I would say to your point, it's it's not so much, it's really the role of the wallet app makers and the tool makers to improve privacy in many ways. Like there was a really good piece recently by a guy named Anthony Roning that looked at all the vulnerabilities, not all, but like, let's say a lot of the vulnerabilities in Lightning <clears throat> with regard to privacy. And the interesting part is that almost all of them can be solved at the wallet level. Almost all, not all of them, but almost all of them. Uh, wallets and, and what you do with your wallet can, can dramatically ameliorate uh, the issues with, for example, lightning privacy. And, and also I would say Bitcoin privacy. So if you could start having in the next year or two, you know, coin join native, uh, or when you open a lightning channel, the wallet is automatically doing some sort of coin join or swap for you uh, without even asking you. 
these things are going to be very important. So I think like the wallet makers have a lot of power. And when you look at like to, to, to change the world, I mean, when you look at the popular apps out there, the popular open source wallets, it's I'm bullish because they're very into privacy. I mean, two that I've worked with in terms of helping them talk to activists are the blue wallet team and the moon wallet team. And they're very both they're both very aggressive about privacy and and you know non custodial sovereignty you know like and it makes me pretty excited. I mean we have we have people trying to do their best here. Now they are what I appreciate what the Moon Wallet team is is doing um, is that they are they understand the trade off between a niche privacy tool and something that's actually going to get used by people right. So like a good example would be you know, the difference between, you know, something like join market and something like the mobile app for uh, Whirlpool or something like that. Like, like there's going to be trade-offs, right? Um, but like, y- you do want more people to use it. And if it's not on a mobile app and it can't be done in five seconds, you're, you're losing 70 to 80% of your users. So, you know, look, we have, we just haven't been there with the technology but like the privacy tools, both for main chain and for lightning need to be on mobile apps. We, like, I really just, I mean, people could do whatever they want and I'm, it's awesome. It's an open source um, environment and we want to support everybody. And the niche users are important too. I mean, the people who are going to spend 12 hours a week studying, uh, you know, running their own node and, you know, may, maybe, maybe running something like join market, like, like from a command line interface. Awesome. Like, these people are incredible. Like they, they help power the Bitcoin ecosystem, but but they're kind of like the shoulders that other people stand on, and the average user is just never going to do that. I mean, I'm sorry. So so it's so important that some of that tech gets rubbed off onto the main population, and that's only going to come with like ease of mobile. And I it, like I, I stress this because of the work I'm doing in emerging markets. Like these people don't have computers, dude. Like they and we're not going to airdrop Raspberry Pis. They have mobile phones. That's about as best as we can do. And they have spotty internet, but they, they can do it. They, they, you know, they have mobile phones. So we need apps that they can use that can protect their privacy. So there's going to be trade-offs, but you know what? Like, you know, we have to push in that direction. I just don't see another way. Yeah, that's very true. Right? And ultimately, you have to use the infrastructure that is available for the local users. And then, well, if there are only phones, then yeah, a desktop application isn't going to cut it. Right? And that will be a, a tool that is not usable for a, a vast part uh, of humanity. Um, so yeah, that has to be taken into account. And, you know, again, it's it's not that it's impossible. It's just very, very difficult. <laughs> and it requires a lot of hours of work and dedication uh, to design and implement and review these uh, these applications. Yeah. And it's interesting because <clears throat> I was speaking to a guy yesterday um, who I've gotten to know recently. His name's Fode. He's from Senegal. He's a, he's a Bitcoin and Lightning engineer. And um, he was telling me about the fact that you know, his world changed when he saw the iPhone, the first iPhone. Uh, he was just so blown away by the fact that you could have a, a full web browser on on a mobile device. And he was he looked at that in 2007 and he said, that's going to change the world. And, and it, you know, of course it has. But I mean, then he under, then then a few years later, uh, quite early, actually, I think in 2010 or 11, he, he got into Bitcoin and he was like, wow, OK, if we can merge these two things it's going to change my country of Senegal is what he told me. Um, if, if we can have mobile Bitcoin usage, that's going to just completely change the country. It's going to empower people. It's going to break them free from monetary colonialism. It's going to break them free from all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's what he's dedicated his life to. And, and again, like, you know, for that to work, we have to have robust, lightweight um, privacy solutions for mobile. So that's what I'm like really interested in looking at. Uh, uh, these days. Um, and you know what, we don't, we don't have a lot of time to like, just sit around, as you say. Uh, guess what, you know, you know, maybe, you know, I, I always hear Bitcoiners say, well, I'd rather have like the bear market or, you know, oh, man, we just had nation state adoption in El Salvador. And, and, and the, the, these people have three months to figure out how to do this. I wish we had another year, or I wish we had another two years. 
well, guess what? You don't get to make the decisions. <laughs> like the world moves on. And now we have nation state adoption of, of Bitcoin as, as legal tender. And there's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of merchants and businesses that in the next, you know, next three to six months need to figure out how to use Bitcoin. That's where we are. So if your solution is not easy, it's it's not going to get used. So, I mean, there, you know, we need to push in this direction of how do we get lightweight mobile privacy solutions for Bitcoin users? This is one of the most important things that we can we can discuss in the coming years. Yeah, that's very true. And the downside here is right that the quick and easy path is the one that is least private and least censorship resistant, right? Right. Easy to get bank accounts for everyone, basically, right? In in some custodial application, uh, that's very easy to scale as well. But yeah, doing it properly in uh, a self custodial mm -hmm. and secure wallet that on top of that yeah. is private. Well, let's unpack that though, because it does help. So even something like Strike, because because consider this. So yes, if you're in El Salvador, Strike is essentially so you have to give your ID. It's full KYC, okay, to set up the Strike account, and it's it's settled in USDT. I mean, it's not even Bitcoin native in a way, but it does provide, it is better than the current system for privacy for this reason. Let's say I want to send remittance to my family there. Uh, well, currently I have to like go to Western Union and like fill out a form. And then they, the Western Union keeps that record of who sent the money. I give them some cash or whatever I give. And the person on the other end picks it up, okay? let's put aside how inefficient and ridiculous and extortionate it is. There's data capture there on both sides, right? Okay. Today I can send lightning to any strike user in this instantaneously. And I, I out of a, a completely no, no KYC open source wallet, that is powerful, right? So at least one half of the equation is pro is relatively private. I mean, yes, we can talk about how strike may try to de-anonymize my wallet uh, through my public key, but I can take steps to make sure they can't really do much, right? I, I could, if I really wanted to, I could, I could coin join into my lightning first, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's things you can do. And we talk about the surveillance capitalist model and how it vacu vacuums up all this information about you. There are these bridges, these halfway technologies that do help. Like even in America, like if you're using something like a strike or, or whatever, um, you know, like you, you know, you could pay something with your debit card and again, full KYC and, and then, but your bank only sees $50 to strike. It doesn't see what you bought on the other end and the merchant doesn't see who you are. So again, there's these mid ground solutions that are interesting that are, that are, you know, just providing a different paradigm. And then of course you have the whole bit refill, um, gift card market which is which is much more privacy protecting like matt alborg from useful tulips did this study uh and he was looking at nigerians who live in the united states i mean they're earning cash full privacy and anonymous cash right paper banknotes and then they're going to like a cvs or a grocery store and they're buying a gift card with that cash again no kyc at all and then they're sending a photo of that gift card to their family in nigeria who then puts that up on Paxful and sells it and gets Bitcoin in their account. Again, Paxful has KYC, but you don't know where the money came from. So do, do you see what I'm saying here? That there's like these interesting kind of new platforms arising that are that are providing, like, let's call it half privacy. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a really interesting point, right? Because Bitcoin is this open interoperable standard where Diff users of different software wallets and different second layer protocols can still communicate and cooperate with it, with each other, right? So you can have this one user uh, being in a custodial money warehouse uh, somehow on, you know, a, a Lightning custodial wallet, fully KYC it, right? Completely have forgone on his privacy, mm -hmm. but still, especially with the Lightning network, where sender privacy is quite well protected. Uh, it's very difficult to find out who sent the money, especially if that other user right. uh, is the cypherpunk who runs everything now, behind Tor and such. Right. Now get this. Um, here's the dream, right? So, and um, I think it was like maybe Matt O'Dell who gave this uh, metaphor first that I, I heard this and I just think it's so useful. So 
you know, in today's world, in the banking system, in the fiat legacy system, you have your bank account, it's fully KYC. They know, the government knows what's going on. Okay. But then you can withdraw it into banknotes at an ATM. Okay. That gives you forward, forward privacy, right? This concept of forward privacy. Now, let's say you're living in Argentina or Nigeria or uh, the Philippines. Okay. Let's say you're using Paxful. All right. So you've got your Paxful account. You can assume, look, love Ray Youssef, great guy. But at the end of the day, it's an American company. You know, they enforce KYC. They have to. Okay. So, all right. So let's assume, and, and you know, you, you don't, it's not entirely clear how much Paxful shares with regional governments. Let's say they have to like cop up some stuff to the American government. But if you're like a user in Argentina, it's not exactly clear how much Paxful shares with that government, if anything at all. Maybe that's worth exploring, but like, that's just a note. But anyway, let's say you're a Paxful user there. Now they are integrating lightning uh, de with withdrawals and deposits. I don't know exactly what day it's gonna like go live, but it's happening. So let's say you've got your KYC light, KYC light kind of Paxful account, and that's kind of where you're earning income into or you're buying Bitcoin with your fiat or whatever. Okay, now you can achieve some semblance of forward privacy by withdrawing to, to Lightning to, let's say, a blue wallet or a moon wallet or whatever. Um, and again, as you say, the, the, the sending is like better protected. So, okay, now we're starting to approximate the idea of uh, an ATM and the idea of having the current world where your earnings are likely, you know, watched and you pay taxes and whatever, but then you can withdraw some of that and you can have forward privacy and the government doesn't know what you're doing. We are starting to see the possibility for that to emerge for the emerging markets through a mobile phone. That's very exciting to me. Yeah, that's very interesting, right? And it's here again, layers of defense. And sometimes it's just very difficult uh, to be private. And especially if this is uh, some official job uh, that is registered with the government in any case, right? Uh, then then here, sure, uh, that that level is compromised, but there can be other layers of defense behind that, right? So withdrawing to your own wallet, doing rounds of coin join, uh, making payments over lightning and such. Yeah. 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 And this is a nuanced conversation, obviously, you know, we've been talking here for, you know, 20, 25 minutes or whatever about this and you can go very deep, but re regardless, it's clear that like there is massive potential here for not just freedom money, but for private money too. And that's why it was, it's very disappointing to see like the, the non Bitcoin digital security surveillance community, like not understand this. It's, it's really disappointing. So, you know, about a month ago or something, two months ago, uh, <laughs> uh, Edward Snowden, you know, he, he's, he's very into like Zcash or whatever. So he, he's given this talk and, you know, I clipped part of it and I, I said how disappointing it was that he was, um, he dismissed lightning as like shenanigans and, and he was, uh, he even kind of like threw a jab at Monero and, and he's, you know, talking up Zcash and I just, I just wanted to say how disappointed I was with that. And then he got very angry and he quote tweeted me and he, he went off on how uh, greedy I was and all sorts of stuff. Um, and at the end of the day, it's quite clear that he just doesn't understand how lightning works. And, and that's kind of sad, but I think he's a good proc. And, and I do look huge respect for Snowden and what he did, but like, this is a proxy for like most people who are in the civil digital liberties space. Like I just spoke at this event called RightsCon, a uh, great event um, that we I've been working with these guys for like 10 years, uh, going to their events. Some of my colleagues have spoken, et cetera, et cetera. And I gave a short talk on, on Bitcoin and financial freedom. There were hundreds and hundreds of panels and talks and sessions. Um, mine was the only one on Bitcoin out of hundreds of talks and panels. And we're talking a digital rights conference in 2021. That's how far away the mainstream community is from understanding what you and I are, are doing. It's kind of crazy, right? Why do you think that is? Well, um, to zoom out more broadly, the human rights movement has not, you know, aside from what we've tried to do at HRF has, has really do, do not understand Bitcoin, like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, like just nothing, like a zero. I think there's a couple reasons. So number one, the human rights movement more broadly, for better or worse, is generally kind of left wing, sort of center left, okay, um, or far left, depending on who you are. Okay, so they 
have these kind of natural alliances over time ideologically that that probably led them to be angry at Bitcoin for various reasons. First of all, it was like just this idea that like it was created by, I mean, again, we don't know who created it. could have been anybody. But I think there's this perception that it's like the Silicon Valley, like rich white guy thing. And, and they really don't like that. That's number one. Uh, the second perception is the environmental thing. And that that's really where I think it comes down to for a lot of people, unfortunately. They think it's boiling the oceans straight up. Um, they really do. And they, they do not think proof of work is healthy or good. And they will fight proof of work till, they, till they're forced to buy Bitcoin later at a higher price that they deserve. And that's essentially what <laughs> the situation is. That The tragic part of that is not only that Bitcoin is obviously this neutral, non-discriminatory global thing that is being worked on by everybody. And that in our last round of dev grants, we gave money to Bitcoin contributors in Northern Nigeria, Korea, India, and the Middle East. But, and like, wh wh where do you think the capital of Bitcoin is today? Well, it's obviously in San Salvador and in Lagos. It's not in New York. So, I mean, you know, this is a global phenomenon. But the environmental piece is really frustrating because uh, that's actually just a misread. Like, like, and I've spent a huge amount of time thinking about Bitcoin mining recently. But I mean, if you care about, like, honestly, if you're like interested in a different system that's not so reliant on fossil fuels, like, that's what Bitcoin is. Like, our current system, uh, the central banking system, is 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 very tied to this idea of like the petrodollar and like the dollar being supported by energy markets and especially by oil and especially through our pact with Saudi Arabia, military pact with Saudi Arabia. So our current system, which the dollar is built on and which the euro rely, which all these other governments around the world sort of rely on, like we're, we're kind of like the central bank of everybody else's central bank. We have these swap lines, we come out, we, re we rescue people during financial crises. Like the US government really kind of runs the world monetarily and we are dependent in many ways on, 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 uh, on this like petrodollar system. So the, the current system is, is extremely, you know, let's say anti-ESG, we'll say. Um, and now Bitcoin doesn't have to be reliant on, on oil or on dictators, not necessarily. It could, meaning there could be Bitcoin mining in various countries of different de democratic degrees, but it, it'll be done by all countries eventually, in my opinion. And if you think about what people like Jeff Booth talk about with technology deflation, um, and you look at the graphs of some of these charts of, of the cost of some different ways that humans have invented to take things and turn them into electricity. I mean, it's quite clear to me that in like 10 or 20 years, like there's just going to be a lot more renewables because they're going to be cheaper, not for any other reason. And Bitcoin miners are completely united in one thing, one thing only, they're only after the cheapest energy. That's it. That's really all they care about. And that's great. They're servants, loyal servants of the network, right? Um, now that's going to lead them to do a lot of things. That's going to lead them to uh, use whatever energy is cheapest. And you know what? Around the world today, in a lot of cases, that's stranded geothermal. Look what's happening in El Salvador with volcanoes. Stranded hydro. Look what's happening in Virunga National Park in the DRC. It's Oh, what energy is cheapest in Texas? Well, solar and wind. So I've got friends who build these big campuses out there. Now, there's also going to be places where, for whatever reason, coal or natural gas are very cheap, too. Some of that might be political, right? In China, essentially, a lot of the coal mining was like essentially like it was like corruption. It was like uh, people who had originally flocked to China to do Bitcoin mining for uh, that was like sort of curtailed hydro, like the Chinese government had just built up all this hydro energy over the last decade, way too much to use. And they weren't able to connect the transmission lines like soon enough. So they had all this sort of unused hydro. And that's where, that's why Bitcoin mining kind of started in China. But when the rainy season would like chill out and it would become more dry, those miners were like, okay, well, what do we do now? And then they like made deals with these like uh, coal plants and they basically got free energy. Uh, and that's not, that's a political phenomenon. That's like not, not necessarily the case. Like if you look at the price of energy, like around the world, in many areas, renewables is cheapest. And I think it's just going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Bitcoiners also have to understand that, again, like the petrodollar system was a non-market system. It was not like the free hand of the market. Like the US government with its power and Saudi Arabia made this pact that changed the world. So I think Bitcoiners need to understand that the energy market is also 
uh, a non-market situation. And whether or not they like it, they need to understand that like, it is a very powerful force right now in the West and even in China and elsewhere to be anti-fossil fuel. And you may think that's inaccurate, unhelpful, whatever. It doesn't really matter because it's happening. So there's like huge social movements towards uh, divesting from these things. And you can't just like leave that out of your calculation. Mm -hmm. So when we think about 20, 30 years from now, how are we all going to use energy? I mean, I think it's quite clear that uh, at least for Bitcoin, it's going to be like in, in a huge way uh, renewable. And that's why it's so sad to see uh, if people who are like kind of like um, part of the privacy technology community dismiss Bitcoin based on proof of work, when in reality, it may help, it may be helping, you know, what they want, meaning like a world that's like more carbon neutral or whatever. Um, also, just the lack of understanding of how important proof of work is and how that is the way out of the fiat system. And that regardless, we can't have, you can't have proof of stake. Proof of stake is, is, is fiat money. Uh, you know, it's it's a small group of people changing the rules and you can't you can't go down that road. I mean, that's what we that's what we're here for to, to, to break out of and, and to build on is a different model. And it's sad to see all these people like, you know, say that that proof of stake is, is going to help us or solve our problems or whatever. It's not, that would just be replacing the legacy system. Um, and look, there's think there's obviously many things the legacy system does well, and maybe those proof of stake coins will, 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 will replace some of that functionality as you're seeing with stuff like Uniswap. Okay. Uh, or stable coins. Great. Okay. Well, guess what a stable coin is. It's literally just another digital representation of, of a dollar essentially. Well, the dollar is the thing we're trying to get out of here. So again, I think that, uh, the reason why we've gotten a lot of skepticism is is a lack of understanding of the, the critical historic importance of proof of work, um, a general skepticism for Bitcoin based on who were the early users demographically, and a lack of understanding of the global, you know, the, how it's this open, neutral, non-discriminatory thing, and the environmental stuff, which I think is extremely misunderstood. So I think that would be my kind of detailed answer. I still have this dream that once the uh, U.S. military is completely defunded, thanks to hyper Bitcoinization, <laughs> uh, it, it, in that bankruptcy court, we will buy up all the aircraft carriers for a couple uh -huh. thousand sats. Mm -hmm. right? And these are, of course, powered by nuclear energy, which is a very right. green and by far the cheapest source of sure. energy. Right? We're going to pack these aircraft carrier carriers instead of war jets. We're going to pack Bitcoin miners and then sail over the oceans. Uh, mining Bitcoin, uh, and most likely it's going to end up in a tragic bo boating accident. But hey, <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole point of it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I yeah, it's interesting. I mean, long term, yeah, I I, I do very much believe in part of your dream in that. In as much as um, I think it sort of reduces the warfare state here uh, in a huge way, um, and that's part of why I'm in this. I, if you look at like why Nixon floated the the dollar. Uh, it was to fund the Vietnam War, which is extremely immoral in my opinion. So um, he couldn't have done it like had they not done that, right? It just wouldn't have been possible to finance. So they would have had to stop the war. They would have had to stop the bombing. And um, I think both left-wing and right-wing economists understand this. There's a really good part in David Graeber's book where he discusses, uh, you know, rest in peace, but he, he discusses this um, in detail that like, that is why Nixon um, floated the dollar. And that's why we left the gold standard uh, in 71. So I, you know, you, you can't say that obviously there's, it's gonna solve everything. Uh, like demonstrably, there were tons of wars during the, uh, during the gold standard. But I mean, it was sort of a thing where like, once you ran out of the gold, you were kind of done and you had to like go find some more gold to keep fighting. That's why like the hundred years war had like many, many breaks in it, right? Um, and, the machine of war just 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 sputters out if it has if you can't finance it. So you looked at World War One, and guess what? The machine of war sputtered on way longer than it should have because uh, Germany, Russia, other countries decided to to just print money to finance the weapons and to pay the troops, and that that obviously was uh, ended very poorly. Um, so if you have a world where you can't really do that, and where each nation's uh, economic strength you know, whether they continue to have a fiat currency or, or like a sort of Bitcoin powered 
kind of like Bretton Woods style, uh, which I think is a possibility, or whether they just straight up use Bitcoin, you know, they can't do that anymore. So that is a very interesting thing that I always think about. So now that we have Bitcoin as the monetary alternative, Mm -hmm. um, how how can we use the beauties of Bitcoin itself uh, to actually be a financial sponsor to those people who are building the tools that we need to manage our finances again? Yeah, it's interesting. I think there's this desire right now from a lot of people, which I, I'm torn on, uh, to try to lobby other governments to adopt Bitcoin. And I'm just not sure that's the proper use of our time and energy. I think we like geopolitically we should let bitcoin do its thing like what happened in el salvador was not a lobbying campaign what happened in el salvador was the result of bitcoin beach a circular economy a grassroots movement being noticed by a government and an opportunistic leader seizing that opportunity and an entrepreneur uh, jack mahler's you know kind of putting the dots together this was not some like uh top down pressure campaign it was an eye-opening bottom-up thing that the government realized could help them. Okay. And then, you know, for whatever reasons, they decided to do it. You know, let's say for self-interested reasons, obviously. Great. The guy knew he was going to be famous. Perfect. Um, welcome to the club. Like this is this is the Bitcoin club. Um, you know, this is going to help you. So that's kind of its incentive mechanism, right? So um I don't know if like lob that sort of top down approach is helpful here. I mean, it might be helpful, but I don't know if it's like, I think we just need to keep focusing on communities, on the tools, on the back end, uh, and on, uh, the apps, uh, before governments more generally speaking, you know, sort of understand what's going on, which is why I thought that the taproot thing getting zero attention from the mainstream media was incredible. Like when we look back in time, 20 years from now, and, and we're like, oh, yeah, like, remember that time Taproot uh, upgraded and like literally nobody knew about what it was is going to be a little crazy, uh, given what we know about how Taproot helps with different financial freedoms and what it's going to make possible over the next decade with other soft forks in the future. Um, it's, it's just kind of funny to me. But then maybe but maybe that's a good thing. I mean, part of this thing is that Bitcoin is so weird and different that people ignore it. Um even with the El Salvador thing, which should have been front page news of every newspaper, you know, <laughs> you know, country adopts new kind of monetary system. That that's a pretty insane historic thing, and like it was like a you know barely mentioned. So, I think that's good. I mean, that's that's why Bitcoin's been able to go from zero to trillion dollar asset uh, without like w you know like without a you know to be honest a massive amount of pushback like. It's just too weird and strange. Like the people in the State Department right now, they don't know what Bitcoin, they don't really know what Bitcoin is. They, I don't think they could just differentiate Bitcoin from like BitClout or whatever on like a quiz. Like I, I think that people at FinCEN obviously can and other government agencies, but the foreign policy of the United States, like these people are not up to speed. Like they are still in the whole blockchain, not Bitcoin thing, which was, which was a very effective social attack on Bitcoin, but also a very effective distraction mechanism. So the world's kind of like got distracted by all this other crap from 2017 onwards. Meanwhile, the Bitcoiners kept building. And I think that we would not have had such a free hand had there not been that distraction. Does that make sense? Yeah, very much. Uh, I I think that that was kind of the good thing, right? With blatant scams going on, again, governments <laughs> yeah. going after the low hanging fruits. Yeah, go after the ICOs, <laughs> you know. Exactly right, uh, and that left us alone. That was that was quite a good thing, yeah, mm -hmm. indeed. Um, and you know, I want to make the connection to one of your previous articles where you wrote about the petrodollar system, mm -hmm. right? Uh, basically saying that the U.S. dollar has a legal tender on oil trade, so that it has to be denominated and paid for in U.S. dollars. Yeah. And, and uh, then, of course, Iraq uh, suggested <laughs> to um, how about we use the U the euro uh, to settle these oil trades, mm -hmm. and a couple of weeks after, American tanks roll in. Now, this is, of course, horrifying, right? And again, your article is a great read on this. But now we have a rather similar situation in El Salvador, 
right? El Salvador has the US dollar um, as a, a kind of base currency, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they say, oh, how about we use this new Bitcoin thing? Uh, what do you think is going to be the, the reactions uh, from the US uh, military base? Yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, the Iraq thing was not quite as fast. Uh, Saddam, just to clarify, he, he announced the idea of a Petro Euro like late 2000 and had really gotten it going by 2002. They were selling 5% of the world's oil in euros. And then, then you know, six months later, we invaded. So um, I think that the US was at like its hyper power moment then. And, and we just aren't anymore. Um, there is less demand for our debt. Uh, the U.S. government now eats more than half of all of the treasuries we produce. Like we eat our own debt. Um, so, you know, debt monetization just happening right now at a massive scale. Uh, we no longer have the muscle. I mean, if you just watch today's conversation with Biden and Putin, like I, we don't have the geopolitical might we used to have, like after the Cold War ended. Like we we're not going after the guy who's like building Nord Stream out and connecting Europe to Russia. And that's going to enable like a lot more non-dollar denominated energy trading. Like the, the, the petrodollar system is, is unraveling, right? It's, it's on its back nine. Um, it, it lasted 50 years very strongly. It'll last a few more, but, but it's, it's in decline. Right. So, you know, had El Salvador, had Bitcoin been invented in like the eighties or something and El Salvador tried to do this, I had no doubt there'd be like a mysterious plane crash with the president or whatever. Um, but we just don't live in that world anymore. I don't really, or at least most people don't. Um, maybe another thing would be like the French empire in Africa. Uh, maybe they would, but, um, but in 2021, I think the U S just, we have different tools available to us. We are not the, sort of this hyper power, uh, quite that we used to be. So we'll see what happens. Um, I think, I think now is a good time. Like, again, had this been attempted in the eighties, nineties, or early two thousands, I think it would have been met with a different reaction, but like, I mean, what man, it's been a couple of weeks and like, what it's been pretty quiet. Like, I mean, Biden is talking to Putin. He's not talking to Bukele. He hasn't flown down to El Salvador. You, you can see that this is a, a peripheral issue. Like you can, you know, that Biden does not understand what has happened. Like, they, they, they are signaling to us that they do not grasp the, the power and historic nature of what just happened in El Salvador. Do you see what I'm saying? Like he's, he's looking elsewhere, you know? Yeah, that's, that's probably true that the, the focus uh, of, of most is elsewhere. Um, yet, yet still, I, I know or I've heard that the IMF has requested a meeting um, and apparently offered they had a meeting. some. Yeah. yeah right? And like, and, what are they going to do? I mean, there? Yeah, I mean, look, the IMF is like a, a, an appendage kind of of the U.S. government in many ways. And um, we don't know what happened, uh, but it happened. And the president continues to be enthusiastic about Bitcoin. I mean, I don't know, like they passed the law, like they're, they're working on onboarding all these people. Whether or not the IMF will try to punish El Salvador is unclear. They may. I mean, they may like, with, you know, uh, pull back uh, loan payments, things like that. This is they've done this in the past. The French have done this in the past in Africa. Uh, a good example is um, it, Niger is this country that has these massive uranium reserves and, and the French, you know, basically uh, colonized Niger. One of the reasons why is, is to get these reserves and they would go in and dig out the uranium and they used it to power their, uh, their country. So they had like 70% nuclear in, in France. So it's mostly from Niger. So at one point, the local leader in Niger wanted to charge more <laughs> and, uh, he was, he was about to sit down and have that meeting with the French. And then uh, there was like a little military coup uh, very conveniently. And uh, apparently the French army was there and they didn't, they didn't do anything. They just let the coup happen. And then the new, the new ruler uh, was, was much more compliant, much more friendly, much more, oh, I'm not going to charge you anymore. So you could think of a similar situation happening here in El Salvador, but I don't know. We'll see. I mean, it just doesn't seem like the U S is that like fixated on this, even on this part of the world, like, it always seems like Latin America was like, even though it was so proximate to the U.S., that it was at least ever since um, the Cuban Missile Crisis in, in the 60s, 70s, and, and, and what happened in Nicaragua in the 80s. But in the last 20 years, like Latin America clearly has been like less of a focus than the Middle East, Russia, China, etc. Right. 
Yeah, I would say so. Hopefully it stays that way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, there's this path to more. Look, as soon as a couple other Latin American nations, you know, adopt it as legal tender, I mean, there's not a whole a lot anyone can do. I mean, we see where this is going. A potential future outcome is that, like, you have this kind of, like, regional zone where there's, like, a very Bitcoin-friendly um, part of the world where there's just, like, open markets, like, lots of foreign investment coming in. Like, people are able to just use money easier um it could be very exciting and, and that's that's possible as long as it's not sort of crushed but i guess i'm what i'm saying is i i, I doubt even the power to crush these things anymore I, like i just don't know how much how much full power the u.s has yeah we, we will see how the situation further evolves um but i'm uh, also very curious to see how how you're on the boots on the ground helping out to build out the bitcoin infrastructure that we're needing uh, so the Human Rights Foundation has now uh, quite a great track record of sponsoring uh, different uh, yeah, free software projects. Can you tell me more about it? Uh, why do you do it? Yeah, so we have this strategy in Bitcoin of doing three things. First of all, just general public education awareness, uh, articles, talks, videos, just trying to get the word out. Um, we created a video uh, with Reason Magazine and it's gotten 1.3 million views. I think that's really helpful. It's like five minutes on wh why Bitcoin matters for human rights. That's been a big hit. We've done a lot of things like that. We're gonna to continue to do a lot of things like that. Uh, second would be trainings, like, you know, sort of privately we do, we work with activists to help them understand Bitcoin. If they wish, you know, Bitcoin's voluntary. They, they have to tell us they, they wanna proceed. Like we basically offer courses that are like, you know, 101, like what is Bitcoin and then, we're sort of like optionally, if you want to learn how to use it, like sign up for our like follow on and then it's their choice. Um, and if they want to do it and they, a lot of them usually do, um, we help them out with that. And the third thing would be development, you know, supporting the ecosystem. So through our Bitcoin development fund, which you can learn more about at hrf.org slash dev fund, we, we, we fundraise from people or people reach out and just donate to us. A lot of donations coming through Bitcoin. We, we run our own PTC pay server. We have pay join, we have lightning. It's a lot of fun. And we then quarterly distribute the funds up. We, we split them up and, and, and support uh, projects working on things that we think are relevant to human freedom, whether that be running your own full node, whether that be multi-sig, whether that be lightning, whether that be privacy, whether that be translation into different languages of Bitcoin works, whether that be running a newsletter on privacy, um, whether that be inventing a new way of doing privacy in Bitcoin. Like we supported Chris Belcher and CoinSwap. Um, uh, that was our first grant. Whether it be core development, we've supported um, Calvin Kim working on Utrixo, uh, Jesse Posner, um, who's who's going to be doing some stuff looking at Frost, um, and he was he was he was also looking at um, he was looking at some smart contracts on Bitcoin that some work he just finished up. Uh, we we supported Gloria, Gloria Zhao and 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 Drew Meta's work on. Uh, like the, the mempool and on civil attacks. So we're looking at um, both the core, but also the app layer uh, and, and the, the broader ecosystem. So so that's kind of where we are. And, and we'll have another round of those in September or so. Okay, so that's that's nice. How does it work? I mean, for, for one thing is that you could uh, donate your own capital of the Human Rights Foundation, but this is also that it works with these passing donations, so to say, so that yeah, other don't, people donate uh, to you uh, so that you distribute it. Yeah, that's that's exclusively how it works. So we don't use general operating money uh, to do this. It's entirely reliant on donors who specifically say, I want this to go to the dev fund. So people can donate and we will use your money to give to devs who we think are doing important work to help Bitcoin be more usable, more decentralized, more resilient, more private. That's, that's yeah, kind of that's, our goal. That, that's awesome. And that, that gives you kind of a, a way to curate, right? And, and to suggest great projects that the donors would otherwise uh, maybe not have yeah, noticed. And eventually about. there's going to be tons of options in this space. Right now it's thin, but um, you have Brink, which is like a, it's kind of like a, uh, a grad school for developers, um, which is awesome. And we, we've worked to support some of their stuff. Um, I mean, you have uh, OpenSats, which is just getting off the ground, which is going to be a way for you to kind of like, uh, I think give more sort of directly to certain devs uh, through like a board they have put together there, which is cool. Um, 
and there's, you know, MIT has the DCI, so they're supporting some core devs there. Um, but you know, outside of that, like it's it's really just corporations supporting devs right now. It's like you know whether it's Bitmax or Gemini or um, Square, um, which is great. We want to see that, but I'd like to see a more broad set of actors in the future doing this work, like across nonprofit space, across uh, university space, etc. So we'll see if we can get there. I mean, obviously, I'd love to see human rights organizations supporting Bitcoin. So uh, we'll maybe, hopefully, we'll get more of that. You know. That's interesting. And so how do you find the projects that you donate to and kind of, are there some criteria for that choice? Uh, yeah. I mean, look again, we're trying to, uh, if you have global money, it's got to be made kind of around the world. So we're very interested in like helping developers and app makers who are around the world, especially in the countries that we focus on, because we feel like they probably understand the needs of the local kind of populations more. So it's great to support the Moon Wallet team in Argentina because they, they kind of like have an understanding of what Argentines need, right? Great, support you. So um, look, we're always we're always, um, uh, we're always um, on the lookout for um, uh, you know new projects. People, you know, you can apply. You can just write to us with your ideas. And also make, you know, if you're in the space and you see something cool that you think should be supported, just, just, just write to us. I mean, it's pretty open. Um, again, we're just, you know, one of many options out here, but we'll, we'll try to have this uh, global focus and, and, you know, that'll probably be what sort of differentiates us at least at first here. And whenever you kind of take someone else's money and with the intent to pass it on forward, right, there's some requirement for transparency. Right, to to make sure that the money that other people give to you actually ends up being being invested in in good causes, uh, how how do you handle that transparency, especially with the relation that maybe some of those people whom you donate to prefer to stay private uh, for numerous reasons? Yeah, well, it's tough. I mean, we're a five hundred one c three, so if you're going to receive a grant from us, you have to fill out a form. Uh, if you're a U.S. citizen, it's fairly detailed. Um, obviously, Uncle Sam doesn't like. Uh, people uh, earning money without it knowing. It, it's considered a prize. So, it, you know, you have to pay income tax on it. Um, if you're not a U.S. citizen, uh, we still have to know. It's a very light KYC thing, but we kind of we kind of have to know who you are um, and report that to the government just because that's how it works. Um, I think that other organizations that are not 501c3s obviously have more discretion. Um And indeed, you can donate directly to, to devs uh, who are pseudonymous through their, you know, Git pages or whatever. Um, but if we're going to support somebody, we, we do need to know. Now, we're not, not, look, it's all about trust, right? Like, we've supported several NIMS. We're not going to, you know, we're not, you know, we're not going to tell anybody who they are. Um, but it is what it is, you know? Like, if that doesn't work for you, then then it's not, and then obviously we can't give you a gift. Um, but we can we can still acknowledge what you're doing. I mean, a lot in a lot of cases, it's not it's not entirely about the money. It's also about the acknowledgement, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, but so then that's interesting that these official um, reports of the donation are not made public. No, uh, I, I, I presume then. Okay, but no. but do you still keep a public record of of where you donated the money to? Yeah, of course. If you just go to hrf.org/devfund, you'll see a list of everybody we've given money to. Awesome. So it's, we're up to close to 20, 20 people in organizations over the last year. And we just yeah, want to keep, keep, awesome. keep it flowing. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a bit more to unpack here, like with, with the donation thing, because, mm -hmm. you know, Bitcoin already enables to, uh, for, for people to, you know, get paid in, in numerous ways. Um, uh, and even anonymously, like with, and projects like BTC pay server make that quite um, well, easy, at least in some aspects. Uh, but where do you see that we can get further uh, tools and toys uh, to get people paid more seamlessly? Um, well, I think that one of the things we're committed to is helping act any activist who wants to accept Bitcoin, we want to help them, right? So for now, uh, You know, BTC Pay is, is it sort of an, it's non-trivial to set up. It is a little bit of a process, um, but it's not like the craziest thing. And 
we'd like for them to have that open source payment processor available on their website. So if anyone around the world wants to donate Bitcoin or Lightning, it's just like very easy to do so. Um, that's just, that's that's one thing we want to help with. We started an internship program uh, with Blockchain Commons, so they're going to be like helping onboard people through this. Like smart Bitcoin students will be like there to like kind of white glove help people with the BTC Pay side of things because it's a little complicated. Um, but uh, it, it, it is getting there. And and there's I saw something the other day even because look a lot of people use like a, a hosted node. Um, you know, for whatever reason, they can't run their own node or whatever. I, I think there's now ability to pay for that with Lightning. I saw something like that the other day where you can now pay Luna node or something in that way, which is cool. But anyway, the point is um, uh, we, we want to help activists get the ability to receive. Like, it's just a learning. It's a journey. It's a learning journey. If we can get you to understand how to receive and store the Bitcoin, that's step one. Step two is understanding that you can like pay people with it, like your colleagues, translators in different countries. Step three is understanding like when you need to sell it to fiat, how do you do that? Because we still live in that world. So we try to like teach people how to as safely as possible sell off uh, some of their Bitcoin when they, if they need to, for whatever reason, uh, you know, what's the best way to do that? And that that's highly contextual based on the country you live in. Um, sometimes it's going to be a service like Paxful other times it's going to be Telegram groups. Um, there's obviously different trade-offs. Like you can do stuff on a Telegram group or in a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace that's you know zero KYC, but then you're like trusting this person. With Paxful, you give up some KYC, but you, but they act as an escrow. So everything's a trade-off. We just want to make sure people understand the trade-offs. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And again, the more technology is being built, the more different options we have. So the trade-off decision-making process. Uh, it can be much more nuanced, uh, hopefully. Yeah, so. the more liquid this gets, the more ever-present it gets, the easier it becomes to do non-KYC stuff. Uh, it, it, it's it's it, it, it's just, um, that's just the flow. Uh, but if there's no one in your country that you know, like if you live in Burma right now or, you know, Myanmar, like it's going to, it may be hard to find someone who's willing to give you Bitcoin for your kiat, right, or vice versa. Um, and, and a centralized service is very helpful for that. Um, and you may decide it's, you know, it's your trade-off that you're making. You may decide it's worth it to sign up for that service. I, I don't know. And, and then, then it's about, again, the morals of that company. Do they then tell the government of Myanmar that you did it or not? I mean, it's unclear, but like, we, we would hope not, but like, <laughs> certainly I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't count on that, but I, I don't necessarily think they, they do that. Like there's a track record of tech companies. Uh, obviously, if the NSA is coming after you, you're toast, but th there's a track record of tech companies refusing that sort of activity or requests like, you know, Google and, and all these companies, despite how intensive they've been with the surveillance state in their in their home countries, they've like refused requests from countries like Turkey or other countries to like do censorship or, or give, give up data. And uh, I don't know. And even in America, like, look, there's a reason why Signal is based in America. Like, I don't know if you read what Moxie says, like, how many times have they like said no to a request from the government? Like he, he actually publishes it. It's like crazy amount. Um, and you know, it's not like they have that much to give up in the first place, just metadata, but the government always is coming to signal to ask them for stuff. And, and they say no all the time. And that's the beauty of living in America versus uh, Burma, because in Burma, they're not going to be like, oh, oh, you're going to say no, that's fine. We'll move on. No, they're going to come to your house and torture you until you give you, until you give it, give it up. So it's very, very important that people still appreciate that difference, even though all societies are imperfect, of what it means to live in a society that has some semblance of rule of law and freedom versus one that doesn't. I think that's very, very important to underline here. Like, it's no coincidence that the inventors of Bitcoin uh, and uh, PGP and uh, Tor and, um, and Signal were like all likely in in europe or america like they, they they were all in countries that probably weren't gonna like and and we did try to go after all those people there's a reason satoshi's gone but like you know there's a reason why moxie marlin spike's not in prison like like we have certain rights here in america does that make sense yeah that is true um but then again uh, a shame when people like ross ulbricht uh get for a similar service completely demolished 100% free Ross, but like, 
it was easier for the U.S. government to make that case for Ross than someone like Moxie, right? Like, like th- yeah. there were there were some. Uh, that's a different. That's this is a different case. You know what I mean? So very um, true. Uh, yeah, but I mean, look, and yes, all these centralized mixers, they're all they're all going to get caught. Like that was a bad business model, but that's why we want the decentralized kind. So <laughs> that's uh, that's key. And in the U.S., I mean, you could actually look at the end of the day. Like I think what the cypherpunks thought was accurate, meaning we can't sit around and wait for the government to like give us our rights. We actually have to just go and take them with open source code. That's the way to do it. Otherwise we're just waiting around forever. And you have all these people who criticize the surveillance capitalist model and criticize Facebook and stuff. And what is their answer? Their answer is to regulate these private companies. And that's just not going to work. Like that's not how you stop surveillance. That's, that's going to just open up the door to more state surveillance. The answer is to, to use open source code and to make it so nobody can surveil you. I mean, that's the answer. So thankfully, you know, we had the cypherpunks uh, and we had Satoshi and now we have a chance. So it's, it's actually a kind of exciting time to be alive, I think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and it's, it's quite remarkable in hindsight, right? the, the amount of freedom, especially the thinkers like the cypherpunks had, right? that, they, that, that were prerequisites for them to even come up with these crazy ideas. Right? So it's, it's, it's yeah, quite, a, quite beautiful yeah, and I don't, to hold in hindsight. I, yeah, and I don't want to, I mean, clearly, like the US government tried to stop uh, public key cryptography from escaping into the world, and they, they tried to stop Zimmerman. But guess what? They failed. So, you know, and to the benefit of mankind. So again, here we are. And I don't think we can ever take any of these freedoms for granted, but, but Bitcoin allows us to have some of them in the cyberspace world, right? It allows us to have property rights. It allows us to have the freedom to send and receive and store and save. And that's now a possibility for anybody with internet access. And that's just really mind blowing. And I, I think that that's, again, if you actually care about financial privacy, I would I would ask you to consider how you could contribute in some way to Bitcoin. Like even if you feel like engineering wise, it's it's a lost cause. Like, well, you know what? It's going to be around for a long time. And and El Salvador is not the not the last nation state to adopt Bitcoin. And you know Tesla is not the last Fortune 500 company to adopt it. It's 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 attributes are too appealing to people. Like it it it's sound honest money is is going to catch on in a way that is hard for anybody here to even imagine over the next few decades like it's so irreversibly going to change the world that i just would say that even if you're working on a different project like try to consider what i don't know five to ten percent of your time would be like on bitcoin like like we could use the help you know you know, uh, putting in 5% of your time is the same advice of putting 5% of your wealth and buying Bitcoin with that. Exactly. Right? Yeah, sure, you can be hedged. It sounds good at first, right? But I mean, once you start it, very, very quickly, you're going to be at 95%, if not 100. <laughs> yeah. So this this is the thing that's being adopted by nation states and Fortune 500 companies. And, and we're, we're, we're just at the beginning here. And, and over time, again, people will, will seek this thing out uh as as digital gold um but you know what they, they're gonna get the digital cash thing too you can't separate the two so let's try and make that digital cash piece as strong as possible and i think all the, there's tools on the table here for us to use even today that are quite powerful uh i just think we should you know it'd be awesome if we could get them into the hands of more people yeah for sure and you're doing great work uh with funding and, and advocating for this development um, so w- what are some of the articles that you're currently writing? Uh, what can we expect in the future? Sure. Um, I'm doing a fortnightly column for Bitcoin Magazine. Every two weeks, I write something. Uh, the last one was kind of a transcription of my interview with Jack Dorsey, which was really interesting. Um, the next one is going to be about how people in West Africa are using Bitcoin to escape from colonial uh, monetary colonialism where the French government still controls like 15 countries um, from Paris in a very outrageous thing way. Um, and and they're, they're fighting back with Bitcoin, which is really cool. So that'll be my next piece out next week. And I'll just keep going. I'm just trying to explore like the, the unbeaten path here of, um, you know, monetary injustice around the world and how, how, how people are using Bitcoin to, to fight back. Yeah, I see. Very nice. So tell me a bit more about the monetary colonialism. Yeah. So, you know, as France decolonized from Africa in the, in 1960, 
uh, around that time, it tried to um, keep a lot of the benefits without uh, the obvious political colonization. So basically what they did is they like made these agreements with all these local rulers that were now independent, that they still had to use the franc. Uh, and they called it the, the you know, essentially the, 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 the acronym for it is the CFA. And basically France still controlled all the money. They printed all the money. They made all the notes and coins. All the countries in this arrangement, there's like 15 of these countries. There used to be a lot more. A lot of them broke away uh, and paid many, you know, paid a heavy price for that. But um, it was an arrangement where 100% of the reserves had to be stored in Paris. So like if you're a coffee exporter in um, uh, Gabon or in like uh, Senegal or Togo or wherever, like, you know, when you sold your goods, like the the foreign exchange, uh, you know, balance of payments increase would, would, would go up in an account in Paris, not, 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 not locally. Now, this was like uh, slightly changed in the 70s where they brought the central banks actually to Africa uh, in Senegal and uh, Cameroon and, and Comoros. But um, it, you still had to give 65 plus percent of your reserves up to the French. Um, you know, and they have discretion over that. The rest of your money, you could spend it kind of however you wanted to as a country, but most of your reserves, most of your savings as a country was was um, was at the discretion of the French. And they get, um, to this day, first right of refusal on any export goods, and they get to pay below market price, and they get first right of refusal on any contracts. So if you want to build a bridge or some sort of infrastructure, you got to got to hire French engineers first kind of at above market price. And then if they don't want to do it, then you, then you go shop around. And the big excuse for this whole thing was that like, it would, it would be like the African nations would benefit because they'd get this low inflation rate tied to the franc and now the Euro, um, whereby otherwise, oh no, you'd like fall into like hyperinflation or whatever. And that's just not really the case, uh, in terms of that being like a social goal, like essentially what's happened is yes, like all these countries have had this currency. So they've been restrained in certain ways and they've had low inflation, but not a single one of these countries is a democracy. Half of them are in the 10 poorest countries in Africa. None of them are in the 10 richest countries in Africa. And it's in a large part because of how constrained they've been. I mean, these economies are so constrained to like stay on this peg that they can't really create, the local banks can't create credit, like that there's no loans happening, like there's no economic activity. It's very depressing. Um, and they're all cut off from the outside world. Like basically if you have CFA francs and you like get on a plane and you go to America or Australia, they're worthless. Like no one will take them. You have to go through your, the Euro. So there's seniorage at that level. So like France and the, and the ECB continue to extract seniorage from these people. There's three times as many people who live in the, French colonies today, as, as there are in France, 180 million to like 60 million or whatever. And they, um, they, they continue to like be able to manipulate that system to get cheap goods, to print money, to get cheap goods. Uh, whereas the, the, the African countries can't do the same, like they can't print money to get cheap goods. Right. So it's, it's, it's just the continuation of slavery by other means. And it's, it's really depressing. And some people are using Bitcoin to escape. Um, to, to enter into a new money system that's not controlled by a colonial uh, occupier. And I, I think that's pretty cool. You can't, you can't colonize Bitcoin. Yeah, the world is sick because the money is poisoned and Bitcoin is here to fix it all. Uh, because the Pantheon <laughs> effect is, is going quite, quite wild, right? And yeah, this, in well, America that is quite the Cantillon effect. That, that one is like the Cantillon effect on Overdrive, the, the CFA. Yeah, exactly. Right. And and people living in, in Europe and America are for sure the benefactors, those who received newly printed money earlier than others. Right. So Bitcoin is a way to break the wheel uh, and to move away from this perpetual theft uh, from everyone <laughs> to each everyone. Uh, quite, quite a bizarre system. But well, thanks to Bitcoin, we have a way to opt out. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for joining me today. That was a marvelous conversation. I enjoyed it quite a lot. Uh, where can the people find you? Thanks, Max. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. DMs are open at Gladstein. You can follow the work at HRF at hrf.org. You can come be with us in person at the Oslo Freedom Forum event series. Next one's in Miami, October 4 5. We'll have a Bitcoin track. It's going to be a lot of fun. You can check that out at oslofreedomforum.com. Thanks for having me.
Yeah, thanks again for coming on. And also a whole bunch of thanks to those people who make the show possible, especially Saxonet and BTC Paradigm who do the editing, Nubuntu who does the show notes, uh, and Yegor who does the amazing artwork. Uh, great crew. And of course, thanks to all the other contributors to Wasabi and all the other amazing free software projects. Uh, keep it going. We have a bunch of stuff yet to build. But with people like you on board, well, it's a whole lot of fun. Uh, so thanks again and see you on the next show. Bye-bye. All right, take care.